Hi, everyone. Um, our next speaker, Eric Schultnik, all the way from Spain, is the CTO of 20, which is a Spanish tech company centered on mobile communications and whose multi-platform um, integrates the best of instant messaging and, uh, and it's, it's a social network that combines the two. Um, he'll be speaking about the future of social communications. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, so uh, here, let's pull. Yeah, so there we go. Yeah, so I'm Eric. I'm from, from 20. I'm going to speak today a bit about our vision for social communications and how we see uh, that evolving. I'll explain a little bit about how 20 has gone through its past and gotten to the point where we are today uh, and, and sort of how we're, how we're doing to integrate because we're now uh, we have the a social network uh, as part of our business, but we've really uh, come to integrate that uh, all the way down the telecom stack. And uh, in the last few years, we've rolled out a mobile operator. And our vision of social communication is how those two pieces come together and deliver an innovative proposition that changes how people communicate, how they discuss things with each other, and, and how they relate to one another. Uh, so to get us started, as both my name and uh, 20's name is a little hard for most people to spell, I put them up here on a slide for you. And uh, I've also put my personal Twitter handle and our engineering outreach Twitter handle there in case you want to opt into any uh, corporate propaganda from us. I promise some of it is interesting and pertains to, to engineering and development. And then I'll, I'll start with a bit history of 20, which is not so easy to read on this screen. So I'll try and talk us through it. Uh, but basically, 20 began about uh, in 2006. It's a typical sort of startup story. Uh, small, small group of friends working in a, in a flat in the north of Madrid uh, just saw this thing happening with, uh, with social networking, that how people use the internet, how the internet was coming to be accepted into society was changing, how people were comfortable sharing things about themselves uh, online was changing. And so social networking was, a, was an inflection point in that. Uh, and you know something that had begun in the late 90s with, with things like Six Degrees, but had started in, in 2000s as the, the internet became so ubiquitous, uh, that really changed into being an opportunity uh, for, for everyone to get online, to represent themselves, and to feel comfortable sharing and change the internet into a two-way median. And so that's, that's how social networking you know, really, really came about. And they set out to bring that to Spain uh, to launch something that really catered to the Spanish market that relied on not just sort of uh, you know real uh, real social social connections and was, it was centered not so much around universities or some of the other things but but really a pure social model everything based around friends of friends a privacy graph uh, driven entirely by who your friends are how you connect with them. And, uh, and that was the, the base underlying thing. Uh, focused a lot on photos, communication, and the types of highly interactive and engaging stuff uh, that, that seemed most salient for that market. And so, so that's how, how 20 began. And uh, it was fortunate. It hit the right, uh, the right pieces uh, early. And it, growth was explosive throughout the 2007 into 2008 and 2009. It was, in, in 2008 and 2009, 20 uh, was, was one of the fastest growing search terms in Google on both, ye both years, in fact. So it was one of very few things to ever uh, make the list of fastest growing two years in a row. The others were YouTube and, and Facebook, coincidentally. And, uh, and that, that growth was absolutely phenomenal. High engagement numbers, millions of photos uploaded today, uh, per day hundreds of uh, millions of chat messages as well, and, and a billion page views per day. Uh, so it was massive, a super engaging platform, and uh, growing really rapidly. Uh, in, within this, the, the whole trend of mobile was, was going on. Smartphones were becoming prevalent. People were moving and inter interacting uh, through them. And 20, of course, wanted, we wanted to represent ourselves in that medium as well. So we began in 2008 to launch a WAP version of our, of our website. If you can imagine that and can remember that, it's only five years ago uh, that, that that was a relevant thing to do, to launch a sort of extremely simplistic HTML version of a social network. Uh, 
things have massively changed since then. In the, in the couple years past after that, we started integrating apps uh, with iOS, J2ME, if you remember J2ME. Again, not actually that long ago, but J2ME was, was relevant and important platform that we addressed. And then on to BlackBerry, Android, Windows Phone, uh, all those things in the next couple years. And that took us uh, into sort of, uh, well, we were still in 2009. We were then in, a, in, a, in very much an ad-supported model. So the traditional sort of social networking, we're relying on the traffic, the huge traffic that all these users were generating with their hours and hours of engagement per day. And we were, we were selling ads to them. That was how we were paying the bills. That's how we were supporting the development uh, of, the, of, of all of our products across all these platforms. And so that you know, was something of a, uh, it, was a it was a good business. But the, the challenge of scaling that, particularly in 2009, 2010, facing the Euro crisis uh, and all those things, was challenging. So we started looking at other ways to expand our business, to grow into other, to other segments. And so a couple of things we tried. Uh, were games and uh, video on demand. So games, of course, if you remember, social, social gaming was huge a few years ago. Zynga and, ev and everything else was really taking off. The fa Facebook launched their platform. Google launched a platform. A few other people did. It was a, it was a massive thing. We, we were in there as well, launched a, launched a big gaming platform. It was, it was good. We had, we had engagement from it. Uh, but again, you have, you know, in terms of monetizing, social, social sort of games and uh, virtual goods that you buy through games are it was, it was a good it was a good business but it wasn't it wasn't huge and wasn't game changing for us so then we started looking at VOD well VOD you know getting people to pay for video to, to get movies TV shows music videos all those sorts of things also interesting compelling but you have a high high burden to overcome in terms of getting people uh, to move away from a, from a model of piracy uh, towards something where they're going to pay for content. You really have to get your product to a point where it's more convenient and, and you know, is a richer experience and, and everything's, uh, it's just the cheap enough that it, it's wor and that the convenience factor is worth doing that instead of moving to piracy. And so, so that was a hard, hard burden. And well, ultimately, we still have premium video on the, on the site today. Uh, we, we don't really do a paid VOD model anymore, relying more on ad-supported video. And so both these initiatives sort of failed, didn't, didn't work out. So, so, so what did we start thinking about next? Well, we had always been uh, having, having mobile operators, uh, the major telcos in, in, the, in the market, as huge advertisers of us. They were big partners. Our, our demographics being you know, the strong, the youth, uh, the youth demographics, particularly in Spain, uh, was very very attractive. Like every every operator loves to have young young subscribers. These were people that were going to be early adopters of smartphones, wanted to use data, wanted to use the the next generation technologies that were there. Get get cool phones, use those phones to talk to one another, engage, and be big consumers of these services throughout their lives. And so we had we had you know a lot of advertisement, a lot of relationships with telcos through that. And, and it was also something that we saw as very beneficial, that uh, our users wanted to be connected. We wanted them to be connected using our apps, being available on chat, being able to talk to their friends wherever they were, being able to, to simply stay connected all of the time. And so we, saw, we thought we had a lot of synergies with a mobile operator. And, uh, and, and we're talking about doing things like branding, you know, doing a branded plan for 20, doing other sorts of integrations. And eventually, we got around to this idea that we should launch something called an MVNO. An MVNO is a, is a virtual mobile operator. It's something where you don't own actual ta radio towers that, uh, that transfer calls and data and everything like that. But you uh, buy, that, buy that traffic wholesale from an actual operator and then repackage and resell and develop that for, for actual end users and subscribers. And so, so that's, what we, that's what we started to think about in 2010 and, uh, and committed to that plan and then started looking for a partner to do it with. And, uh, and that's how we got uh, connected, connected into Telefonica and, uh, and ended up deciding that we wanted to align ourselves with Telefonica, bring them in as a, as a key partner for doing this because having Telefonica with us as a major investor was the best way to align our interests. So that was in 2010 that we... Uh, we uh, partnered with Telefonica. They became our major investor. And we started working on building out our MVNO platform. Well, 
building out an MVNO is is rather complicated, which is you know why the next date in here is 2012, because it was from the end of uh, we started working in Q4 2010, and we launched the the massive commercial launch of our MVNO was in Q1 of 2012. So so it, it took us a while. We had to get the basics down. I mean we had. Uh, we definitely, you know, we felt that the the space, the operator space, was something that we had a unique ability to do something different in. That we had experience building applications, building websites, uh, and fundamentally, we were, you know, our company was the lifeblood of our company was building building cool things. So we thought we could build interesting applications and websites and things to allow you to, you know, a better a better online store, uh, a better experience for uh, subscribers to. To buy a SIM card, to buy a phone, to do things like that, and uh, to get to get support, to get customer support. We thought we could make all of that better through building applications, but it did take a while for us to get all that, all those applications built out and the systems built out to support that. And but in the end, we launched in in 2012. At the same time, we were uh, realigning some of our our mobile applications to to match this MVNO strategy and to to really try and take advantage of the best of the best of telco on one hand. And, and the best of what we could do at, as a social network on the other, and integrate that into one proposition. And so that's where, in 2011 and 2012, we started to integrate these two things into, into the space that we, that we define as social communication. OK? So those refocused apps and our MVNO launched in 2012. And so then 2013, where we are today, I'll explain a little bit about how those things look. All right, so as I said, we're taking, you know, on one hand a, a, so, a social network, and then the other hand a telco, and we're trying to trying to focus on what those what the key pieces of those two things are, and what when you when you put them together, what is it, you know, what is it about, you know, what what's the value proposition for having the social network that you're using integrated with the telco, and how is your the telco that you're using better if you're also using a social network that's that's from the same company integrated with that experience. This, that was a fundamental uh, vision that we were trying to fulfill. We, you know, we, we really felt that you could build interesting, innovative, unique things and deliver a better service if you brought these two things together than if they were, than if they were kept separate with this sort of you know, hard distinction between the, the base of you know, SMS, calls, data beneath, and then a totally different set of applications on top. We felt there was a unique way to combine and, and add more value uh, above and below that line if, if you could integrate those in a compelling way. So that's what we set out to do. So here's a, I'll walk through a few. So backing up generally, so what do we mean by social comms? How do we define it? There's a, you know, if you, if you look at the Wikipedia definition, it's like a whole general thing about how society exchanges information and perceives it and stuff like that. So in our, in our context, looking at it from the social network and the telecoms graph, we're primarily focused on uh, products and services that allow individuals to exchange information with each other. Uh, we, we do this in a, we define this to be explicitly bi-directional. So you're exchanging information and, and we're focused really on those, that interaction. To the exclusion of stuff like uh, you know, the more traditional media uh, that's more of a broadcast oriented thing. So we're not so much interested in stuff like uh, blogging. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's more asymmetric. There's not the same back and forth. There's not the same real time stuff. So we're, we're in defining social communication trying to really focus, focus ourselves on the type of engaging interaction between, between two people. Between uh, between small groups of people, that's you know very much where both sides are equal participants in that in that conversation. Uh, in that sense, we I would sort of characterize it as being a subset of what people have have often called social media, where you where you talk about which you know generally includes blogging and Twitter and the more public broadcast type things. Uh, we're really focused on again private small conversations between between friends between small groups. All right, so, so how does this look? So a couple things. So the first, I want to, before we go through all the features on, on what we do and how, how we do this, I mean, we have, a, we have a clear proposition of bringing these two things together. It's that we, we try and make all the apps uh, add value to the, to the telco. The fundamental premise of that is that we've made all the apps effectively free as part of your use of 
use of the telecoms uh, plan. So if you're, if you're a subscriber in 20, uh, you have all your app usage bundled into your tariffs. And including if you're a prepay user, once you run out of balance, you can continue to use it uh, based, on, based on your previous usage. Uh, so so this, uh, this allows us to do a few different things and differentiate in a, in a pretty unique way from uh, people who are either only offering telco services or only offering applications are able to do. And so uh, there's a few interesting things about how we serve uh, our apps then uh, based on this premise. All right, so first, so stuff that we put into our, our integrated social communications offering uh, is first, first of all messaging. So this is the, the chat, the uh, user to user uh, messaging as well as, as well as small groups. Uh, we've put both these things uh, in the app in order to, uh, to allow you to basically have what you would normally do by SMS at the at the application layer, we bundle that into to the to the app, and of course, have made those apps all free uh, with no additional costs onto your regular plan. So you can essentially use this communication service uh, to talk to all your friends as part of your regular uh, telco subscription and usage. Uh, we've also integrated your voicemail into this, so gotten rid of the the concept that you would have a have a you know that you would get an SMS alerting you that you have a voicemail and you have to dial into some number. You get it through our app as a push, as a push notification. It comes in. You can tap it in the app to play it. And it's threaded directly into whatever chat conversation that you've had with, with, that, with that other person. Uh, this includes, I mean, our, our messaging client obviously works for the people who are, who are your friends on the social network. But we also allow it to work for contacts. So anyone who has you have their number in your phone, in your phone book, you can chat with them through our app, uh, just just as you could SMS them. So if you can SMS them, you can you can have a conversation with them through our app as well. Uh, we've recently extended this to do to do VoIP calling as well. So you can you can call people over VoIP through our app. Uh, this is uh, app tap VoIP calling. So you can place calls that are effectively free for you because your, your side of the call on the VoIP app is, is free. Uh, if the other person is on, uh, is, on, is on the app, they can receive that call. And for you, it's free, whether they're on our operator or another one. For them, it's obviously going to be cheaper for them if they were also on our operator. And that's part of the way we're adding value and create, you know, trying to create a create a drive for why people should be on our operator and have, have these things together, because it, it certainly uh, would be for their benefit as well. And then we also have, have migrated some of the social sharing features while trying to refocus this a bit. Uh, and so we, we do allow the, you know, the, typical, the typical stuff in terms of sharing photos and statuses, those core sort of features of the, of the 20 experience are in our refocus apps as well. And so we allow that, that promotion, to people to have conversations around, the, around this media. It is a little bit more broadcast, but we've still brought it, in, brought it into these apps. And then finally, we've taken all the account management stuff. So this is all the stuff you would normally need to do for your telco uh, that in many traditional, traditional telcos uh, offer it. You, you might have to go into a store. You might have to call someone up on customer support. Uh, we've tried to pack as many of those settings into, the, into our actual applications uh, as possible, including stuff like topping up. You can do directly through the app. Uh, just you know, one, If you have your payment credentials saved, it's just one click. Uh, really fast, easy, and you have to remember, of course, is that the, our apps all your data on our apps all continues to work even if you're at, totally out of balance. So if you're a prepaid user, you run down to zero balance, you can open up the app, the app will work, and you can directly top up through there. Really simple, and it's been actually quite successful for us. We actually have a lot more uh, top ups overall uh, after launching this, this kind of stuff than we did before. Uh, so it's been quite quite successful. We also give you you know usage data about how many uh, how much data you're using, calls, uh, all that kind of stuff. On top of that, we're exposing your 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 bill with with the full call history. So who you've called, who you've SMSed, all that all that sort of stuff is directly in here, and you see not just how much it cost you, but who you were at, who you place those calls to. So we'll map the you know the phone number back to their back to their 20 account, and you can see who it is that you've been talking to, and see how much all those calls are costing you uh, in one place, as opposed to before when you had your phone obviously gives you your call history and your telco gives you your bill with a bunch of phone numbers on it. 
we've merged those into one to give you the social layer on top of that bill uh, as bringing all that data into one spot. Uh, so, so those are a few of the, the core bits that we've tried to take and all package together and put in the app, integrate some of the telco experience in uh, directly into, into our social apps. All right. And again, I mean, just to underscore, because this, this is a communication service, it's critical to us that it be as cross-platform as possible. So we've uh, tried to support as many uh, platforms as, as we can and as really that there's demand for. Uh, we have iOS, Android, of course, but also BlackBerry, both, ver both versions of BlackBerry that are around right now, and, and Windows Phone. So uh, we, try and, we try and serve a lot uh, because we want to we wanna create the expectation for you that your friend, no matter what type of phone they have, can also have the app, can also be on the other side of that conversation. Uh, it's not going to be a situation where they, it isn't available for them. As a communication service, you have to have some, some amount of ubiquity, right? You have to have the expectation that most of the people you want to talk to are able to participate, able to receive those messages. Otherwise, it's like if you're trying to SMS someone and they didn't have, you know, their phone wouldn't support SMS or something. It just simply wouldn't make much sense. Uh, so we try and, try and deliver our apps cross-platform so anyone, anyone can use them, and we really hit uh, the vast majority of phones in the market. If for some reason our apps don't support your phone, it's probably time to buy a new phone. All right. So, so in terms of some numbers, just to just to just to give you an idea of where we're at. So we're at 170,000 active subscribers on our on our, on our mobile operator uh, right now. Uh, compared to our six million active mobile users, that might not sound like a uh, a huge number, but uh, you have to consider it's really hard to get, uh, I mean, if you've ever tried to get even 10 people to pay for something, it's quite difficult. So try and do that uh, 17,000 more times. Uh, it, it's, it's an accomplishment we're pretty proud of and we're happy that, it's, uh, that it continues to grow fast and we're converting a lot of people uh, to this vision of, of integrating their communications uh, into one solution. Uh, it's not so much of a telco audience, so I won't get into the, the prepay and SIM-only distinctions there and, and comment on that too much, but it just gives you some more numbers. Cool. So now, I mean, let's talk about the future. So where is, where is social communications going in general beyond, beyond 20, of course? Because, I mean, we have one particular vision. Uh, we have some ideas that we're working towards, uh, but part of the, you know, the beauty of coming to an event of uh, like like campus party is this is a uh, this is a place where there's going to be a lot of uh, different ideas, a lot of different uh, technical topics being discussed, a lot of new trends being talked about, and so so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about you know what what we think sort of some of the some of the trends we see, uh, and I'll definitely uh, leave some time at the end to hear from from any of you out there uh, who have other ideas or want to ask questions about these things as well. Uh, so so one of the things I want to I want to make a, make a point of is that technology will continue to transform how people are communicating. I mean, I think if you can remember uh, how you sort of, for example, made plans with someone, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, before I mean, before mobile phones were as ubiquitous as they are now, you had to really make plans substantially in advance before you left a, a landline. Uh, it was a pain. You had to be rigorously scheduled. Mobile phones sort of changed all that and allowed you to 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 work in a much more to live and work really both in a in a much more ad hoc way. It transformed hu that human behavior and completely uh, changed how we structure those interactions. And and I think examples like that are only becoming more and more frequent over time as the uh, technology as different technologies become available. And for, for different types of communication and exchanging information, it is changing people's uh, expectations of how to behave and their, and their typical what they do day to day, how they, how they talk with their friends. And if you consider stuff like SMS, for example, I think it's, a, it's another, another great example of this, where the, the concept that you can communicate quickly, asynchronously, uh, and, and so briefly uh, is, is very, has been very transformative. It's really changed people's expectations, uh, and the the fact that you know SMS is limited to uh, limited in the amount of characters you can use sort of reset expectations. Something that was a limit on on what that what that protocol could could transmit 
actually became a pretty defining feature and allowed people to be, uh, made it sort of socially acceptable to be brief and use poor grammar. Uh, that, you, that you had this different mode of communication uh, that, uh, that really worked in a different way. It was no longer, you know, you weren't expected to write, you know, flowing paragraphs or anything like that that you might have if, it, if you were mailing a postal letter to someone, for example. Uh, so you had those those sorts of those sorts of changes have been happening, uh, you know, and the pace that, that 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 change is happening is only is only accelerating. So so what we're most interested in is how do we how do we build things and how and perhaps more interesting how are users going to perceive those the things that we build the technologies we expose them to. Uh, in the, in the future, and how is that going to change their behavior, and how is the availability of that technology uh, going, to, going to have a sort of feedback loop uh, with how they're then using the applications and communicating. So a couple points here. So one thing we, we think about the future is it's good, it, everything's just moving more and more real time, more and more always connected. I mean, the, the sort of flurry of activity, the back and forth of messages, uh, the amount of stuff that you're trying to do, uh, the expectation of reachability that people have. I mean, the, there's an expectation now, uh, which didn't exist five or 10 years ago, that when you send someone a, a chat message, that or it's a message that they're going to get, uh, I mean, basically immediately. Uh, it's, it's different. I mean, it's not, it's not the same as email or, or, or something like that. People really, I mean, everyone has a smartphone. Everyone uh, is going to be capable of receiving that message. And so that's a, that's a change that's, uh, in expectations, and that's you know an important aspect of how it's moving is the ubiquity of smartphones uh, moving around the world will really create this sort of always connected state and the expectations of users that everything be in real time. Another point. So so I think another another expectation is is we move not just to people having one smartphone, but people having two or you know or three connected devices, or and and moving in between them all the time. It's really important that all these products be totally stateless and cloud-based. I mean, that's something uh, that that traditionally, uh, even even if you look at a, a protocol like XMPP, on which most of the current like chat chat clients are based, uh, the XMPP standard had things in it like. Uh, even if a, a user was allowed to have multiple clients connected, uh, messages were only sent to the, mo the most recently active client uh, out of all the user's clients. Well, the problem with this, right, is if you're carrying on a conversation between multiple devices, uh, you might loo you lose stuff. If you're chatting away with someone on your computer about your plans for tonight and then walk away from your computer, that conversation history isn't automatically uh, on your phone as, as it was defined in... Uh, according to the XMPP sort of sort of standards, uh, and that's something that's that that needs to change. the The expectations around that have to differ because it is, you know, XMPP thought that it would be expensive from a bandwidth perspective to broadcast everyone's message to all their clients and things like that, and that's just not a reality. Technology has changed now. Uh, people's expectations have changed, and it's completely reasonable that people are going to be talking on the computer, get up, and still want to carry that conversation on from the from their phone, and they want no disruption to that experience. It needs to be entirely fluid, which means that the the real state has to live in the in the cloud, not in the device, and you really have to keep everything synchronized. Okay, multiple devices. Yeah, was that was. The, pretty much that, that sort of a point is that we're going to have the, that expectation. And then, yeah, so seamless through the top. So, so this is just a point, I mean, as we sort of, I mean, our, our goal is to very much merge the, the experience you have messaging, calling, communicating at the application layer with the sort of native dialing messaging that you get through, through SMS, traditional calling, that kind of thing. We want those things to be seamless and, and your experience on, on VoIP or something to be comparable to the point that a user isn't, isn't aware. That's, we're not there yet. I mean, our, our VoIP and, and everything else, there are you know, issues, issues with it that, that the legacy calling 
uh, doesn't have. But, but these are things that have to converge. The pressure is there. It's going to drive uh, the expectation that, you, that users really don't know the difference between whether it's a VoIP call or a, or a, or a traditional call. Uh, and SMS is the same way. SMS is even a little more advanced in terms of how interfaces look and work that you know, the, the ch most chat interfaces are, are sort of indistinguishable from what the native, uh, the native SMS interfaces are. So, so app manage. So again, this is getting back to how we are taking most of the, you know, the telco stuff and trying to trying to stick it into the app, like, you know, the whole the whole range of stuff. I mean, I just think it's a, I don't know. I'm an I'm an engineer. I don't. I really hate the idea that I would have to go uh, down to a down to my operator's store and chat with them about uh, changing something about my roaming settings or something like that. Uh, because you know, in all likelihood, then the sales guy just sits down behind a computer and. Uh, and does it through some terminal he has anyways. So we're, we're trying to put that all into the app, uh, and we believe that that's the way it goes, that people should be able to self-serve, uh, that they shouldn't have to interact with any, any sorts of uh, customer support people. They shouldn't have to dial up for anything. And they, we, shouldn't, excuse me, we shouldn't even ask them to go to a website to do that. I mean, it should be something they can do right from their phone. We should deliver a seamless experience for that. And they can they can administer and manage that directly through an application. And so, uh, a last point is just to make stuff uh, asynchronous and really support the multitasking use case. I think this is something something interesting. Getting back to to you look at how uh, how SMS was adopted as a communication form and became so much more massive than anyone really envisioned. I think one of the qualities that uh, that SMS had was that it's asynchronous, that you can send someone an SMS and you don't feel like you're demanding their attention exactly in that moment. You're basically saying, when you, can, when you get to this, please respond. And, and that's sort of uh, the difference in that level of expectation that you're putting versus giving them a call. A call demands their attention in that moment. You're asking them to take up another, the other side without exactly knowing what you want to talk about and respond in the moment to you. And so, so that's a different, uh, uh, you know, there's a different level of, of demand that you're placing on the other party. And so I think so social communications in the future is going to embrace that even more, that, that ability to be asynchronous, that you'll send, send messages to be uh, in, in a more asynchronous way with the expectation that people are doing other things and that they're going to be uh, carrying on multiple conversations at once because they can deal with they can deal with juggling that when the communication is asynchronous and I think you, you you're starting to see this already in some of the uh, sort of push to talk type applications and things like that that are that are coming onto the market and that are are starting to become more mainstream uh, that sort of interaction the ability to to quickly and easily send people messages in a way that it, that places less of a, a burden on their time and attention than a traditional call does, I think is, a, is an interesting trend and undoubtedly something that we'll see, see more of in the future. Uh, so these are a few thoughts just on, on some of the trends. Uh, and so I wanted then to, to open it up. If people had questions, ideas, uh, things like that, uh, they wanted to, you know, Opinions on on what direction that we're we're going to take things that social communications in general is going to go how the how how the market is going to trend in terms of what people uh, what people have available to them and how the behavior uh, of people using those technologies is going to change uh, I think it's a very interesting space and uh, obviously and and I think it's we're we're really at a point where it's just continuing to accelerate that pace of change. So I'm sure someone out there has, has ideas or questions or wants to hear more about something related to, related to this. Hi. It's my first time hearing about 20. Uh, I'm coming from China where WeChat is very big. Yeah. And could you sort of talk about uh, your, you talked about being global. So. Um, what uh, regions are you strong in, and how would you contrast with WeChat or some of your competitors? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so we're uh, extremely strong in Spain. That's where we where we began, and that's where we have a uh, an operator license right now to run our actual telco service. We've made our, we've internationalized our applications and made them available in uh, about 15 different languages at the moment, 
And so you can use our, our sort of the social, uh, the social features at the application layer can be used uh, in essentially any market. We have no particular limitations on that. Um, but we are, because of our, our legacies, we're strongest in Spain and then in South America and a little bit in the rest of Europe as well. Uh, based on based on our Spanish heritage, uh, but we have we do have a fair amount of uh, in terms of feature set. There's a lot of similarities to, to WeChat and how the messaging works and things like that. I mean, that's a WeChat is a, a very successful chat client. Obviously, that they, they, they came out of China, uh, and yeah, I mean, it it bears a lot of similarity to to what we do and how our stuff works. Um, but our I think our, our unique focus at this point is trying to take that down into the telco stack and leverage our ability, uh, given our, our locality in Spain, uh, to create a more integrated experience between the two. Cool. Other question? Thanks. You mentioned something about cloud. And yeah. obviously there's so many varieties of cloud and completely agree with the, uh, the requirements that are associated with that. Can you tell me what your plans are for the cloud? Sure, so we're actually, I mean, we primarily, yeah, so we really primarily run our uh, our own our own physical servers. I mean, we came about in, you know, 2006, pre-Amazon uh, Web Services and all that stuff being, being the trend. And so when I, when I use the word cloud, I very much mean just that it's, you know, we aren't, putting a lot of load on the user's device to actually be any sort of a definitive data store that we're putting all the all the all the data up up into our cloud um, and in terms of you know how how that works I mean we I mean it's we take a pretty conventional view on how on how our our servers and architecture and everything operates and essentially we run a, a data center at the you know keeping with the normal the normal sort of internet company standards of you know, multiple reliability, multiple providers, connections, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, to try and try and really meet the user's expectations. Of course, that everything's always available, that it's always going to be working, uh, and if you know, have a pretty mature solution for that. And to a lesser extent, we actually do use Amazon Web Services for some stuff, uh, but but our core is still in our in our own our own managed data center uh, up there. And in the process of becoming the major social network in Spain and maintaining that position, what have been the major problems or the you have had in that or sure. drawbacks, the major drawbacks? Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, obviously, I think our our big challenge in in Spain. I mean, it was really. Well, first on sort of the product and marketing side, it was a, the first initial year. I mean, the, the hard part of, a, of any product is how you, how you get it beyond the, the initial sort of people you know uh, sort of sphere. So, you know, between the people on your team, you know, a few hundred people or maybe a thousand. And so you, you get a product out to those certain people and it's how you go beyond that. Uh, I don't think we had anything that was... Uh, Particularly unique to Spain in that in that challenge of overcoming it. I mean, our our marketing efforts on the at that point were sort of on the ground stuff, uh, guerrilla sort of marketing of going out and finding groups of people, going to events with groups of people, and trying to seed clusters uh, uh, with those people, influential people, etc., and get get them all on onto the service and using it, and then making the the product itself viral so that once people were in there. They uh, had a, had a reason and wanted to uh, invite invite more people to the thing, uh, and then particular challenges in Spain we had was actually I mean to to some extent related to the to the previous point about about servers and infrastructure and things like that uh, for the for the scale uh, that we needed to do stuff at I mean we were 20 to 25 percent of the the Spanish internet traffic was running through our servers and uh, and so. I mean that that required a massive amount of uh, investment on our part, and the sort of lag time in being able to get that infrastructure in Spain and deployed uh, was a, was a big challenge, just because there weren't other people operating a data center here at that scale, and particularly ramping it up that quickly uh, was a big challenge. Uh, so that was 
something something we faced was was how to how to build an an internet business uh, at that point. I think it's something that because of the more prevalence of cloud infrastructure providers that you have today, I think that's a little bit simpler because you can rely on on some of those offerings that are out there uh, to to get you off the ground at least to begin with, and then if you architect your system correctly, you can scale with them as well. Cool. I don't know if there's any anything else particular with that you want to be talking. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I just had one last thing to make. So, so we run a, uh, a coding competition uh, once a year or so, and so the fourth edition will come in May of next year. So, uh, this is a fun sort of hacking event where we we post 10 to 20 problems. Uh, you can see last year's problems at contest.20.net if you want to play with any of them. We have the problems up there and the solutions on everything. Uh, it's a bunch of different, you know, it's a crazy variety of sort of nerdy and computer science-y problems. Uh, so it's fun. You can follow uh, 20eng if you want to uh, get the updates on when we actually open next year's edition. Uh, the winners, as you see, we invite to come down to our office in Madrid uh, from across Europe, in fact. Uh, and so uh, we host them for a couple days and have things like a barbecue, do, do a bunch of in-person uh, team, team challenges and stuff like that, and then eventually give the top 10 prizes and, and select some winners. So it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good fun event. We have uh, three to 4,000 people participate every year. So it, it's pretty successful, and I'm sure uh, Campus Party is the, the perfect sort of target group uh, that might be interested in this. So please check it out. Cool. That's everything. Thank you very much.